Hi, it's Kyle Coverline, and boy, do I have a treat for you today. Uh, I have Doug Jones. He's going to do some video with me and talk about his history with the company. Uh, he's been the parts director ever since I've been here, which has been 15 years. Uh, but Doug has 41 years with the dealership. Uh, and then had five years before that, back when it was an international-owned dealership. I think they called it Deal Corps. These are all questions we need to find out from Doug because he's been around for a long time. So really 46 years total with the brand. Uh, but I don't want to do a lot of yabbering. And, you know, I just w we'll jump to just Doug talking about, you know, being with the company and all the stories he has to share. So here we go. I was born June 9th, 1956. So... Been around right here for about 66 years or so. So you're ready for retirement. Ready for retirement, yeah. <laughs> uh, do you mind sharing a little bit just about growing up before we get into your career? Yeah, uh, well, I'm, I'm an old farm boy. You know, grew up on the farm. Uh, learned the value of working, working hard, and then getting the job done, you know. So um, grew up in Nicholas, well, actually was raised in Bath County that moved to Nicholas County. Okay. And uh, on the farm, we, we, my dad was a sharecropper. We... Uh, we raised tobacco, we raised cattle, we raised horses, we raised a little bit of everything, you know, just was farm boy. So come up on the farm, working hard and going to school, get home, do your chores, play sports and and continue on, you know, so come up, come up working. You know, I've been working there since I was probably 14 years old, you know, just actually working. Wow. And uh, of course on the farm, you know, you start working a lot sooner than that. but. But working out to where you make money, I started working at the IGA store in uh, Carlisle, Kentucky, when I was almost 15 years old. Wow! So been working quite a while. You know, so, <laughs> you know, started so, 15, man. Yeah, yeah. So, and then worked worked during high school. You know, worked uh, in the summer. You know, mowing mowing and everything. They had high school programs back then where you could actually go and work through the summer and make money. So, so you so you say you started 15. Yeah, 15 at the IGA. What, 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 what year is that roughly, you think? Uh, that would have been probably, see, I graduated in 1974, so that would have probably been in 70, 71, 72, somewhere okay. along in there. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, uh, and then I graduated high school, went to work at train company for, for a year and a half. They had a big layoff over at train company. So I was still yet drawing unemployment, uh, not working, just, you know, just, right. just out there out laid off and, Got tired of that and then actually wanted something to do, so I started searching the papers and found a delivery job position at International Harvester Company at the branch store over in Lexington. Okay. And that was in, uh, I started there August the 3rd, 1976, uh, and had, you know, just kind of, as the company changed hands, I've been here ever since, so. Uh, so, so technically you're, you're celebrating 40 one years with the dealership. With the dealership. But you've actually been, since then, it's been 46 years. Yeah, I actually had five years with the International Harvester branch store. Okay. Uh, before Al Crime bought the business in 1981. Is so, that what was called like a deal core or something? Uh, deal core was actually when Al bought the business. So, okay. Yeah, so we were a branch, uh, an actual branch store of International Harvester, uh, the company. And uh, Okay. So I worked there, started the delivery, you know, and... Quick move, move pretty quick through the, you know, through the, getting promoted up. I also, when when Al bought the business uh, throughout the years, he always said, "I'm my plans are to stay here for 20 years, and then I'm going to get out of business." Well, almost needless to say, to the day, he sold it, you know, in 20 years. About 20 actually, years later. John now bought it in uh, September 28th of 2001. Okay. So, so throughout my career, though, I've been, yeah, you know, I started as a delivery driver, moved into the warehouse, moved to the back counter, moved to the front counter, did outside part sales for just about 10 years. Okay. Then came back in and trained for uh, parts manager for almost a year uh, when our uh, manager at that time was Tom Morgan. He was retiring. Okay. Uh, trained almost, uh, almost a year uh, and then became parts manager in 1991. Wow. So, so how I know just for people's history because you're one of the few that still remembers a lot of this stuff. Right. So, but even before you started, do you know any kind of historical facts about the the dealership or like when certain things were? Because I was talking to another employee from a while back earlier today, and he was talking about like a international harvester store on Third Street. Third Street. Yeah, yeah. like in the 
right. in the 30s or something like that? Yeah, I don't know how long they were, were on 3rd Street down there, but they were downtown for several years before they moved out to Industry Road. Uh, they moved to Industry Road in 1962. Okay. Uh, so whatever time frame that they were from before that, they were down on 3rd Street. Uh, and, and International Harvester at that time, you know, they sold, you know, sold tractors, uh, you know, they're, they're the Cub Cadets, lawnmowers, you know. Right. Uh, so they had a lot of different things. And up behind us on the industry road used to be a company called Brandeis Machinery, which which actually was a part of International that sold the heavy equipment. Oh, okay. So they sold the dozers and, you know, panners and all that type of stuff. So International Harvesters, you know, has been, had their hands in many products. Uh, but the gentleman that hired me in, his name was Tom Morgan. And uh, he actually was the parts manager at the time that I hired in. Uh, he, you know, he had been down on Third Street as well. He worked down on Third Street, uh, so he hired me in. Like I said, I hired him as a delivery driver, and then from there, I just kind of promoted up in different uh, portions of the business. In night, like I say, in 1981, Al bought the business. In approximately 84, 85, he opened up another location in London, Kentucky, which okay. is which is parts only. Uh, okay, so parts only. At parts department. only at that time. Yeah. So that's, that facility was 84, 85, somewhere in that neighborhood. And then in 1989, he built the building, the, our Somerset location, the building down there, he, that building was built. And they went into business in 1989 in Somerset. Okay. So that's how the three locations became about. Uh, so, so we presently still yet have the three locations and going into a new dealership, you know, new facility. Right. That's in our London location. So, yeah. Yeah. So, but I've been, I've been involved in, you know, when, when I started, we unloading trucks. You didn't have forklifts, you know? <laughs> so so when a truck came, we got stock orders once a week. Uh, a truck came, and you could, we had big, huge, huge boxes of, of parts come in. So we had a, we had a pallet jack, no forklift. So uh, it was always the truck driver's job to get the parts to the back end of the trailer, and then from there we we hand lift them off the trailers. Wow. You know, so you'd have. One guy get on one side of the pallet, on each side of the pallet, one in front, and then when it came off the trailer, somebody jumped behind it. You set it on the ground, then you actually took the pallet jacks, moved it into the warehouse. So you can imagine the yeah. intensive labor that was involved. No, no in, and then also in those days, you know, you nowadays you can actually go buy a brake shoe that's already on steel put together. In those days, you had all lining is what you you bought brake shoe lining and rivets. And you have places that actually would have to go. You take those shoes that steel and get get them riveted on to make your complete brake shoe. Also, those days people didn't buy a lot of drums. You know, if your drums are still good, you get them turned. Well, on the tandem axle tractor, right? You take off four wheels, you know, tandems, and put the drums on them. And then our, our delivery vehicle was a little 100 series pickup truck, International 100 series. You load those things in, take them down the Third Street where they had a place that actually turned those drums on the wheels. Hmm. So you had, you know, a lot of manual labor back in oh, those no, days. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So times have, have came, have changed quite a bit, you know, with the manual labor and also, you know, just the way of doing things. So, right. So, um, uh, in, in 19, like say approximately 84, 85, we opened up the parts store in London. I had a gentleman that worked with me. Uh, uh, he used, he, uh, he was from Western Kentucky. His name was John Feather. So John went in down there as the parts manager, opened that facility, and then another guy that worked with us, Lonnie. Lonnie went down there and worked the facility with John. So, uh, you know, at that time we had parts only, uh, two locations, business was good. You know, when we came in in the morning times, usually the door opened up, we had customers lined out the door. Oh, wow. You know, from, from eight to five, <laughs> five o'clock. <laughs> And you know, everybody then there was no such thing as credit cards. People want to pay cash, you know. Right. So, so they come in, they bought an engine. The engines in those days probably you know three thousand dollars or so. So they come in, count you out three grand. Uh, so you can imagine the times the bank was right up the street. So you can imagine the times we had to run to the bank to take that money out of the cash drawer and deposit it in the bank. So, oh wow. But that was just the the the, I, the you know the way people thought. You know, they didn't want credit. You didn't want right. something you had to pay for. You want bought it and you paid for it then so wow so things have really changed in that regard and then like say in 89 we opened up the uh 
Somerset location, and at that time, it was right at that time or close to it, we also opened up an ideal lease facility that was a separate building from the dealership, which was uh, across from the Somerset Foods location down in. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Like, so right not too far up the road. From not too far up the road. Yeah. yeah. So we had that, uh, you know, the ideal lease facility as well as the dealership. So we still have the uh, uh, the dealership open, but the ideal lease facility part of it has been sold down there. So so we no longer have a facility there for ideal lease. So um, you know, I've I've been one end came in the management in 1991. So I've been in management of some type in the parts department since 1991. Uh, started out as parts manager and even though we had managers at the other locations, I was sort of over all three of the locations as I am today, still right. yet. But, uh, you know, we, inventories, I took over all the inventories still yet, just did my last three, you know, been the month of September for-, for You gonna, you gonna miss doing inventory? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I can't count the number of inventories I've done throughout my career because you know even though I wasn't running the inventories, where everybody was involved in doing inventory. So, oh, yeah. so yeah, we've had them. I've been doing inventories, and that's that's one part that I'll be glad to get rid of. You know, <laughs> a lot of headaches involved in inventory. I've done one. I've done one. So. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, like I say, back in the day, they they didn't have parts and service expos with international. They had them. They had just the parts uh, the trade. What they call a trade fair. And that was pretty much regional. Most of the time we would go to Atlanta or somewhere like like the Chicago occasionally. But they were just all just parts. It wasn't anything as far as involved with the service departments. Um, and they'd have, you know, you go and the, the idea was for you to buy bulk, bulk parts, you know. Right, yeah. So it was always a competition between the different dealers, you know, who could buy the most, you know. But, but the main thing is you, you got the opportunity to buy things that you needed at the dealership. So... Um, and, and as times grew and, and, and things changed, they eventually evolved into parts and service expos, which is what they still yet have today. Okay. So, and you get a lot of training, uh, get a lot of, you know, you meet a lot of people, a lot, a lot of acquaintances. And throughout my years, I've had, you know, made a lot of acquaintances with Navistar people as well as other dealers. And we've all became good friends. You know, it's been a, it's a business you can get into and, it's challenging. You learn something every day. You know, they're always learning. You know, that's why I tell the guys today. You know, I got one guy that started here on the counter not long ago, Tom, Tom Russell. And Tom was saying, man, it seems like I'm learning something all the time. I said, well, it'll be 10, 15 years from now, you'll still say I'm learning something. Yeah. Because you're in this <laughs> business, you continue, continuously learn. You know, it's, a, yeah. it's something, you know, you, it never gets boring because you're always dealing with different people. Uh, and it's what you make of it, you know, if you get yourself involved and work with the customers and deal with the customers, you, you become friends, you know, it's like a family, you know, it's the same way it is here at the dealership, you know, I think Woody and I were talking one day last week and I told Woody, I look at it just like here at the dealership as a family, you know, I had throughout my career, I've had three work families, you know, the International Harvester family, the Cron family, and the Bluegrass family, so, so it's all, it's all, it's all been good, you know. So the career's been good. Yeah, yeah. You you got any good like personal stories from work you want to share? Just something that sticks out or anything? Or well, I do have back in when we were actually uh, uh, with Cron Internet. Let's you know this goes back before Cron. It was when we had a branch store. You know, we we had different managers every year. You know, uh, so the the branch managers that came through the branch store were there for a year, and then another one would switch out. So we, we were fortunate enough to have, you know, four people throughout the, the my, my time with the branch store. Uh, one was Dave Rofen, one was uh, Roger Hansen, one was Dick Sweeby, and one was actually Don Meyer. All of them became owners of dealerships through the deal corps program. So oh. we had uh, Dave Rofen, I think, went to a West Virginia location and helped open up a dealership on the deal corps. Don Meyer went to Miami Valley in Cincinnati and had that uh, as a uh, ownership of that through the deal core. Roger Hansen in Buffalo, New York, and Dick Sweeby in Memphis, Tennessee, which uh, Dick Sweeby, I think, for, out of all of them, had the biggest chain of dealers. He was started out as Diamond International and grew into Summit International, which had about 30, 40 locations. Oh, wow. So, you know, there's a lot of knowledge that came through the branch stores. 
And at the time we were a branch store, we used to have, if, through the parts department, if you made your hit a go, we'd all go out to a place called Cliff Hagen Steakhouse, which is no longer there in Laxton, but we had, we had the parts department, we have a meeting, you know, you go meet at the Cliff Hagen's. So when Roger Hansen was the branch manager there, he asked one day, asked Tom Morgan, who was our manager, uh, can I join you guys at Cliff Hagen's for dinner tonight? Morgan said, yeah, no problem at all. We only got one rule. You, nobody can wear a, a tie. So back in those days, you know, all the branch managers wore a cup of tie. So needless to say, Roger Hanson walks in with a tie on. Uh, Morgan says, ah, oh, see, so you made it to the meeting. Yeah, I told you earlier, we're going to allow ties at our, <laughs> at our meeting. <laughs> so he pulls out his pocket knife, cuts his tie off right up here to his, to his collar. <laughs> and you can imagine the branch manager, you know, Roger Hanson, he was a fair skinned guy anyway, he turned beet red, you know, so so and then he kinda of chuckles about it. And of course Morgan tells him no ties at our meeting. So the ne ne the next day, you know, Al, uh, 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 Tom Morgan went out and well when he came in to work he had a the same style of tie, the same name brand, brought it in, you know. But Roger Hanson learned from that point, you don't come to parks meetings with a tie. So, <laughs> that's awesome of course these days you know uh, uh, things are, have relaxed you know uh, you, you don't wear a coat and a tie these days and you know, everything's kind of casual but back then it was strict you know branch manager you wore a coat and tie you know uh, but and it was all good fun you know we everybody worked well together everybody had fun enjoyed themselves and that was one of the little small thing I could think of back when we were a branch store that happened and you know, throughout my career, as far as with Cron and also with Bluegrass, you know, you've had a lot of different people, a lot of different personalities, and, and, and you know, you just meet a lot of people, and, and you like to become family. You know, oh, yeah. it's just, uh, you're working with people eight hours a day, sometimes longer, it's all family. So, so it's been a lot of, a lot of good days, a lot of good days. Was that about what you got for me? Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's probably, that kind of takes us all the way through to where we are now. Uh, you know, we, uh, we were fortunate enough to, to, you know, to have Woody, you know, John's son, to be be promoted to owner. I think he's actually be, you know, become our owner now. Yeah. Uh, part owner with the Mike Roberts and got a brand new dealership going to, up in London, Kentucky, and wish everybody nothing but the best. You know, uh, uh, people wise, you as well, Kyle. You know, you've been a. I remember when you came over. Uh, and was looking to, to get into the business. Yeah, I, wanted, I was looking for a parts job, and you told me you didn't need nobody. Yeah, you came in looking for a parts job, and uh, at the time, we didn't need anybody. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. But it worked out where, you know, you actually got into a sales job and have done very, very well, you know. And, I got two, so I got two questions for you. You already kind of touched on one. Okay. Is if, because this video, hopefully will, this, you know, the whole point is to last, just so people can remember it, and memories right. don't get lost. Right. So, if you have advice for somebody who's, because you have a career, Yes. Yeah, you know, this wasn't just a job. This is a career. It's a career. So, what ad yeah. advice would you give to somebody starting in this industry? Well, as I said before, you're always learning in this industry. So, I've always had the mentality that you know, if I get into something, I see that I like it. I want to learn, continuously learn and grow. You know, and, and advance myself to be the best that I can be. You know, so, so my my so advice to you know younger people of the day. You know, give give the opportunities a little time. You know, just uh, when you get into something, everything's not going to be kosher, and and you know everything's not going to be great from the start. Maybe sometimes maybe it is, but it takes work. You got to grow. You got to grow, and the more you keep you know learning yourself and and trying to learn and grow to make yourself better, it becomes better for you and all your fellow employees as well as being able to support your family. You know, this has been a career for me where you know, I've been able to support my family and, and you know, I've been able to retire from here. It was always one of my goals was to stay somewhere and put in the time and be able to re retire and actually can look back and say that you accomplished something, you know. So I've had a lot of different employees that work under me. Uh, it doesn't, it's whatever I've accomplished here is it's always taking a team. So no matter what you do, don't forget about the people that you're working with, you know, just to, Continuously, you know, to yeah. You know, sometimes it's not all work related; it's personal, you know. So you, you can have conversations with people, you know, if they, if they feel like they can trust in you, 
and you can trust in them, they'll come and open up to you about anything. So just, uh, you know, always remember that, you know, it takes other people to, to make a team, you know, so continuously you have to improve yourself. And if people see you trying to improve yourself, they'll come along and try to do good for you. No, that's so, true. So I got one last one for you. Mm -hmm. So you started when you were 20. Yes. What would the retiring Doug Jones go back and tell his 20 year old self? <laughs> well, I, I've always been a, you know, even though I was 20 years old, I, I think I've been a little more mature uh, for my age because, you know, when you come up on the farm, you have responsibilities. So, you know, it's, uh, it depends on where you are in your, in your, in your life for yourself. Uh, but as a 20 year old, you know, uh, don't, don't jump into something and just give up all of a sudden, you know, I mean, of course, everybody's got different ideas of what they want to do, but you know, if you see something, you know, you, you get in there and you say, well, I don't know where this is for me or not. Don't just give up on it right away. You know, put a little time and effort into it. Then if down the road, if you see it's not for you, you know, then, then move on to something different. But, but no matter what you do, always give your best. You know, if you give your best, then there's nothing more you can do. So that's about what I would say to anybody coming out of school, a 20 year old this day. I mean, it's been a good career for me. So like I say, this is all about realizing and understanding it takes more people, not just yourself. It takes a lot more people than you to get anything accomplished.